Good morning. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are meeting this morning to, uh, to hear a bit about H196, uh, which is an act relating to supporting the work of the Executive Director of Racial Equity. And so we have with us this morning, Susanna Davis, who is the Executive Director of Racial Equity. And uh, we are seeing if we can pull the bill's sponsor out of, um, out of his uh, committee meeting this morning to see if he would like to come and speak to this as well. But Susanna, since we have you with us this morning, um, I would like to invite you to uh, help us understand uh, what H-196 calls for and, uh, and what that would mean for the work of your office. Yes, um, thank you, buenos dias. I am Susana Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. And um, H-196 effectively, per, based on my last read of it, um, would create two full-time positions to support the work of the Racial Equity Office. Um, I, I have heard a lot of people refer to the Racial Equity Office over the last year and a half since I've been here. And it, the office is just me. It's just this guy in a room. So uh, it, it would effectively create um, something of an office by adding to staff. So this is something that does appear in the governor's proposed budget as a line item for $250,000 of FY22 money. And um, I suppose one of the questions that I often get asked is what is this going to do? And what is it going to mean? And there is, um, I suppose, a, a a simple answer that I could give, um, this is money, or rather this, the, the money that this would be, sorry, this funding allocation would uh, lead to staffing that is a huge assist for pretty much everyone around the state. Um, I, I remember telling uh, other cabinet members that um, this proposal is exciting for me, but it's more exciting for them because what it does is increase the capacity for their work to be more equity informed and to receive additional assistance that it's sometimes difficult for one person to provide. So there are uh, a lot of different aspects of this work and the enabling statute, which is Act 9 of 2018, outlines a number of duties for the racial equity director, including but not limited to overseeing the statewide collection of race data, developing performance targets and metrics for um, racial equity, developing and conducting trainings for state agencies, overseeing the state, I'm oh, sorry, I said that one already, um, doing a top to bottom org review of all three branches of state government to identify systemic racism, develop model policies and mitigation practices, et cetera. Additionally, over the last roughly year and a half since I've been in the role, um, a, a long list of items have been added to that charge um, by various statutes and orders, the person in this rule sits on nine committees formally. Um, and also I interact with uh, about, I think, 17 total. And I serve as liaison between two for the enabling statute. So, you know, it was a little bit more difficult um, in the before time, before everything went virtual, because of course, if there was a one o'clock in Burlington and a three o'clock in Bennington, you couldn't do both, you had to choose. These days, because everything is virtual, I think you all would agree, we all find ourselves bouncing from one meeting to the next. Um, and it's actually created an additional workload because it's been so much more permissive of um, people being in more places at the same time. Now, it's, that's an opportunity that I greatly appreciate because it permits this, um, it permits our work to have broader reach around the state, which became especially important in the summer of 2012, after another person in the United States was murdered on camera by the government. And the nation this time really felt it, felt it very deeply. And it caused an incredible groundswell of um, renewed energy around equity, not just in criminal justice, but in all sectors of American life. And so what that meant for my work, and I imagine for the work of equity practitioners around the state, is that we were absolutely flooded with more inquiries and requests and offers and pleas for help. And it became something that was 
both exhilarating and overwhelming. I say exhilarating because in some places, the hardest part of equity work is convincing people that it matters and that they should give a damn. Um, in Vermont, that has not been the case. In Vermont, I, I, I have rarely had to convince anybody that this work was necessary or meaningful because what I, what I really appreciate about the state is that folks get it. Um, and if they don't get it, they wanna get it. So it's never been about convincing people that it mattered, but rather last year, what we really saw was so many more people who were willing not just to acknowledge that it mattered, but were willing to actually do something and who reached out to the state for that assistance. Um, so that means added um, things like trainings and um, lectures and appearances and uh, deep dives, policy reviews. I've been contacted by numerous municipalities around the state looking for assistance with creating things like codes of conduct or model policies on equity. Um, localities looking to hold events or create um, funding streams, schools who are looking to do equity-based reforms, people who want to do more recruitment and hiring, um, people who are looking for training opportunities, people who are forming new committees or new advisory boards and want guidance or membership. And so, um, so, so it, it's really been very positive and it's been, um, I mean, it's disappointing that the circumstances were what they were that led to that. But, um, but it's absolutely a good thing that more and more people are on board and see the urgency of this work. Now that's the exhilarating part of it. Um, the overwhelming part of it comes about because there are only so many of us um, who, are, who are doing this work formally. And I do always tell people when they say, well, you have such a big job. I say, no, we have a big job because it, it can't be one person or a handful of people's job. So in effect, it really is everyone's work. Um, but having the role formally and having this carved out in, in statute and in the admin means that there's a certain level of um, oversight, a certain level of eyes and ears that, that we want to be able to have around the state. And so it brings me back to um, H196 and to the governor's proposed budget item, which would permit all of that work and more to happen and not just to continue happening, but to expand. So I'm gonna give three examples of those um, work streams that would be improved through funding. But before I do, I am gonna pause. I know that the bill sponsor has joined and I wanna stop in case there's any questions so far. I'm not, oh, not seeing any hands raised. All right, continuing the monologue. So uh, one of the main work streams is uh, committee work. I already mentioned, I interact with about 17 committees. I formally sit on nine and I liaise between two and the cabinet. Um, having additional staff is gonna permit this office to be in all of those places as required by law or as required by good practice or common sense. It allows us to be able to have a presence in spaces like hearings and community meetings. Um, it is often to great disappoint, with my great disappointment that I have to sometimes pick and choose which legislative hearings to attend because racial equity has a role in every topic. And sometimes it's difficult to decide, um, should I go talk about brown people dying across the state or brown people getting arrested across the state? It's a very difficult decision when, when hearings are happening simultaneously. So having additional staff means that we can be in more places um, provide that real-time guidance to folks, attend all of the community meetings, whether they're happening evenings, weekends, early mornings, or during the day. Another work stream is training. Um, that is something that is mandated by the enabling statute. It's also one of my favorite parts of the job, actually. Um, so being able to develop and conduct trainings for agencies is technically the only bit that is actually required of this role, but State agencies, of course, aren't the only ones who really, really need to understand the underlying issues, grapple with them, and work equity into their work. This is a job for individuals, communities, select boards, schools, faculty, administrators, corporations, not-for-profits, you name it. And so really the trainings, while only mandated for agencies, are really morally necessary for everyone. Um, I've been conducting trainings for all of those kinds of organizations that I just listed, and 
again, it really is just about how many different places can you be at once? Um, how many different topics can you um, lecture or present on? How many different ways and places can you deliver this important and sometimes life-saving information um, to people? So additional staff is also gonna permit this office to provide that, um, to provide those trainings. And another important piece of this is that I think a lot of times people assume that, um, you know, you're just gonna do a round, do the round with all the agencies. Everyone's been trained on equity and that's it. But we've got decades of data that show us that learning is not one and done. It needs to be refreshed. It needs to be re-upped. And it happens most effectively when we receive information in smaller bits over a consistent period of time, rather than just doing a half day session for four hours and then saying, we know everything and we're gonna re retain all the information forever. So the training really is an ongoing piece. Um, of course, there's also data that show that training alone is not going to solve systemic racism. So we acknowledge that training is one piece of the pie, but it is an incredibly important piece of the pie. And so having additional staff also permits us to be able to do that, um, to reach effectively people in education institutions at all grade levels, to reach professionals in all sectors, and to make sure that we're delivering a consistent message across the state one that is not sort of piecemeal or patchwork, but rather that we are unified in our messaging and that people are um, being consistently shown where the state's values are and what the state's plan is. The third work stream that I'll talk about is data analysis. Um, I am by no means a statistician, a mathematician, or anything of the sort, but um, data are so incredibly important when we're talking about equity work. And I don't just mean racial equity, any sort of equity whether we're talking about disparities for the LGBTQIA plus community, people living with disabilities, seniors, young people, you name it. If we're talking about equity, then metrics matter and math matters. So having um, been in this role for about a year and a half, I have come to rely very heavily on state specific data, national data and highly localized data where it's available. But in order to really do any kind of analysis, I've often had to rely on data scientists and analysts from other agencies who've been willing to uh, lend their time to do that analysis or on organizations who have found the capacity to do certain analyses. A number of great reports and um, surveys and other findings have been conducted by community groups in Vermont, often uncompensated, um, but those data have proven tremendously valuable to us and to our work. So again, additional staff will allow us to be able to not only receive the volume of data that is increasingly being collected in Vermont, but also to do the deep dive analyses that are necessary so that we can really surface those disparities and more importantly, do something about them. So um, I, I think I've gone on long enough. Um, I'm, I'm gonna stop there. And uh, again, thank you for, for the invitation to be here. I'm happy to take any questions or speak further on something I've mentioned. Thank you, uh, Hal Colston. Uh, good morning, Susanna. And uh, I want to thank you for your your service and your leadership. And I do believe your office is making an impact. Um, my question is, <clears throat> if these two positions are put in place, how will legislators benefit from this move? Well, that's the big part. You all are big winners in this. Uh, the the, the additional position, so I, I have to say, um, this role is situated in the administration, but it is a statewide role and therefore requires collaboration and access to all three branches of state government. I have been extremely pleased and grateful with the level of interest and collaboration and commitment from the legislature and the, and the, the oh my goodness, the who? Los Jueces, oh my gosh. Why am I doing this? Tomorrow? Judiciary. Um, and, and so one of, the, one of the inquiries that I've gotten most from legislators is review of policy, responses to policy, how does this impact people of color in Vermont, or rather, how can we make it impact people of color in Vermont? Um, so one of the big benefits to legislators with this additional staff is having people who have that policy, that dedicated focus on policy and data, who can do deep dives with you all on how policy can be impactful for people of color, 
Um, for example, in the executive agencies, we are required to do equity impact assessments for all budget and policy proposals that come out of the executive agency. But right now, there's no such requirement for legislative proposals. And so we're kind of backfilling that on our own by doing these analyses. Sometimes that can be overwhelming for agency folks, but additional staff in the racial equity office means that we can have people dedicated to doing those um, equity-based analyses for a much broader swath of legislation. Additionally, I find that a lot of legislators who want to bring this work into their districts and into their communities often reach out for things like um, panels, speaking, uh, other kinds of speaking engagement or presentations, um, specific community work. And again, it can be a little bit different to, to be spread out across the state that way. But again, having additional staff here permits us to be able to work with legislators on more district specific measures that could move the needle on equity. Thank you. Uh, Mark Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Yuzana, for, for being here today. Um, you had mentioned the uh, equity impact assessment tool, um, and it sounds like that's gonna be rolled out over the next year, is that correct? The one that we're using is already in effect. It has been since late last year. So we've already been conducting uh, these, these equity impact assessments on proposals coming out of the admin. And policy analysts in the various agencies have also been instructed to use them when they're doing bill reviews that come from legislature as well. We do understand that members of the Social Equity Caucus are also in the process of creating an equity lens tool that's gonna have a similar function. So um, we are really looking forward to that effort being completed in the legislature as well. I don't know the timeline on that one, but I can say that for the executive side, we are, we've already rolled that out. And I guess maybe the other question I've got is, and I, I mentioned this in committee one day, as far as, you know, we already have our results-based accountability uh, process. And I'm, I'm wondering if you thought that maybe some of this, and you had talked about the equity caucus also looking at another tool, some of this couldn't be rolled into that as well, because uh, as you had mentioned as well, it might be a little overwhelming for some of these departments, but just, just your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And um, one of the things that one of the people I'm most grateful to have is the chief performance officer um, who's, who's really steeped and well versed in this. And she's somebody with whom I also have worked closely on a number of these items. I do agree that um, unsiloing this work is important. And as much as we can leverage RBA and some of the lean work that we've been doing, it's only going to make it, it's only going to make us stronger because it will ensure uniformity and consistency across our system. So I suppose the short answer is yes, I, I do see opportunity to, to blend these streams and I appreciate the comment because it's an important one. Thank you. Tanya Vyhovsky. Thank you, Madam Chair. The magnitude of the lift that you're describing, I think is probably bigger than, than even three people can manage. So I'm wondering what your priorities are with new staff people and where you would sort of deploy them first. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think that if we're talking about two FTEs, then the vision that the vision that seems to make sense is to have one person dedicated to more policy and data analysis, and another person dedicated more to education and outreach. Um, you could cut this work up in a million different ways, but I see those as two major buckets that could probably use a dedicated focus each. Now, of course, you could you could assign an army of people. To this work and there would always be enough to do. Um, but another important piece of, of equity work is that it not be concentrated in a small team, uh, but rather that it be spread across state government and done across agencies. So I think that um, this is a proposal that helps us to find a good balance between having folks who are dedicated to the equity piece, but also ensuring that it's not only loaded into that unit, but rather still being spread out across government. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a modest team, but I think that that's, pro for now, I think that that's gonna still bring us um, a lot more power behind the work that we've been doing. 
Thank you. As a follow up to that, given that you're really pointing to the need to spread out across state government, do you think being housed under the administration is the best place for this work? I know that there are a lot of options that have been discussed even during the formation of the initial enabling statute. And I am going to respectfully dodge the question because I think that I think that if state, if, if, if members of state government across the branches are sincere about equity work, then they're gonna do this regardless of the formal structure. You know, if you're on board, you're gonna do it whether the law makes you or not, whether this is here or there or somewhere else or not. And, and so I care very much about the, the structure of it. And, and that's a conversation maybe that, that could or should be had. Um, but I also think that regardless of the structure of it, that shouldn't uh, stop our colleagues around state government from being part of this work, whether or not something is situated in a different place or whether or not they're formally required to. Thank you so much. And sorry if I put you in a strange position. I just thinking about all of this conversation we're having about independence and the importance of that kind of brought that to mind as you were talking. So I apologize. Thank you. So I'm going to invite the bill. with us and please share with us your thoughts on uh, on the bill that you've presented. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair uh, and my colleagues and especially Susanna. Uh, what can you say on top of what she said? <laughs> um, this work that um, we're working on together. Um, I, I've mentioned this a number of times. This is a marathon. It is not a sprint. And anybody that's trained or helped someone train for a marathon knows very well that there's pitfalls, there's rigor, and there's the need for uh, commitment. So that kind of answers all of those questions that were asked along the way. Um, is Vermont committed? I think we are. I've been doing this work long enough to watch it grow over time. Is it growing fast enough? No, but it is growing and that's positive. Just in our own body. I've only been here for 10 years, but what I've seen over that 10 year period is people change their hearts and minds from where they thought they were to where they are now. And being an educator and just another human being, you can tell when people are changing. And we are as a legislature, and that's why it's so important right now for us to recommit to this work. Susanna put it very well. Uh, I can't really add to the detail uh, and I would choose not to. Um, being one of the sponsors of the original legislation and having it vetoed, you know, and going through all of those phases that we went through. I understand change, but at the same time, it's working. And if we can give her more tools along this journey, we're going to get to where we want to be. And this isn't, this is just the beginning. And remember, it started with that position of executive director 
and or advisory council. And as long as we continue to support the effort, we will get to that goal of making Vermont as inclusive as we want it to be. And, and I apologize for being a little late, but that's, I had two other calls, one with the Chamber of Commerce and one with Vermont League of Cities and Towns on this same discussion. So everything that Susanna talked about, that's what we do. You know, um, those of us that are doing the direct work do get called on, you know, a lot for support, but that's part of the work. Um, you know, another uh, analogy, because being a teacher, I like analogies, uh, telling students that you brush your teeth every day, not just once every few days or once a year or something like that. And that equates to the metaphor uh, that Susanna was referring to about training. I like to call it professional development in enrichment because that's truly what we're trying to do versus training trainings yeah i did it got it done no no we're talking about enriching and changing the hearts and minds of vermonters and that's what this work you know is really about and and, and we're up to the task and and it's very evident because if we look at all of those bills in the last two years since the inception of the position, we've said that department needs to be there. So we're saying that the emphasis is there. So we're at a point where we can support it. And I think that uh, with Susanna's leadership in that area, we'll be able to achieve our goal. Um, so I, I, I I'm in full support of whatever we can do from the policy side uh, within our branch to support her efforts and the efforts of her department. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Um, we do have uh, a couple of witnesses waiting for our next committee uh, segment, but I wanna um, call on Hal and also let you know that we will be coming back to this after the joint assembly this morning. Um, uh, Susanna, I, I know I'm quite sure that you have a packed morning and, and may not be able to come back at um, approximately 11 or 11.15, but we welcome you to come back if you can and, um, and coach as well. So Hal Colston, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so Susanna, um, given that this office continues to grow and develop, what might our state government look like in five to 10 years with regards to racial equity? What, what are your thoughts? Really good. <laughs> Um, so in five to 10 years, um, well, I, I know I say this a lot, apologies for repetition, but in 10 years, um, it would be really great if you just didn't need me anymore, you didn't need this role anymore, I should say, because we will have baked equity into everything that we do, um, and it will be so fundamental to our work that it doesn't necessarily need to be looked out for. But um, it's a long road to get to that place. And so in the meantime, during that five to 10 years, it means that state government is gonna have more opportunity to uh, learn the practices that need to become second nature. Just as an example, we've rolled out the equity impact assessment tool that I mentioned earlier. And right now we're, we're getting accustomed to it. For some folks, it's a little easier. Others are stumbling through it because it's, it's a new practice for them. Over these next few budget cycles, legislative cycles, we're going to get increasingly adept at using the form, at recognizing its utility, and at using it to be able to spot any potential unintended outcomes and um, anticipate more opportunities to make policies better. So it's, it's definitely a journey. I, I don't pretend that any of this is going to flip the switch overnight, but that's one way that we're going to get to a place where equity becomes second nature. Um, another thing that I can envision is a lot of changes in numbers. A lot of numbers are gonna go up that we want up and a lot of numbers are gonna go down that we want down. 
for example, maybe in the next year or two, we might implement a policy related to policing or criminal justice. We may, we, we may not see those impacts right away, but over time, we hope to see numbers trending in the right direction. And when they do, that opens up more possibilities for us um, to make other changes. For example, Vermont in previous years was able to have its prison population, its incarcerated population. That allowed us to make a lot more um, discretionary calls because we weren't incarcerating people for lower level offenses. We weren't holding people unjustly. And because of that, we have less need for things like beds. We have um, lower need for supervision than we would have had had we kept our population as high. So I, I see a lot of opportunities for us to move the needle in the way we want. That's gonna yield not only cost savings, but it's also going to make government just generally more efficient. And it's going to make Vermont, it's gonna, continue, it's gonna help Vermont continue to be a place that people want to go. And that's important because our population is dwindling and it is aging. And so being able to not only attract, but also retain people to the state means we've gotta be able to create an environment that is not just habitable, but that is genuinely desirable for folks. And increasingly, um, the demographic shift around the country is that people are becoming more racially diverse. And so it would be um, very concerning for Vermont to remain an unusual pocket that deviates from that otherwise generally universal norm. I don't know if I've actually answered the question, but I, I suppose the vision for five to 10 years from now is we're great now and we're gonna be greater then, and it's going to be the result of consistency, which is, is really key. Thank you. So thank Madam you, Chair, Susanna. Oh yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, I know that you said that we were gonna um, cut it off, but I just had one more thing that I wanted to say. Um, yeah, that, that I, I don't, I say it often in, in closed door situations, but I think it's important to say it here, which is, um, I've been extremely grateful to have this opportunity to do this work. Um, you wouldn't necessarily know it, but I am a, kind of a private person. I actually don't really like a lot of um, eyes. So um, it, it, it's, been, it's been unusual for me this last year and a half um, to be very visible. But one thing, so, so when you have a face to a role, especially a new role that no one else has had, it's very easy to personalize decisions that get made about that role. And I just wanna remind the group that when we make decisions about racial equity or when we make decisions about the role specifically, we're not making them for Susana, we're making them for the work and for the role. And I think that's, that's really important, right? I've sometimes heard people referring to, well, we'll just put Susana on the committee or we'll just give Susana some money or some staff. And, and I just wanna remind folks, this isn't for me. Um, it, it, it's for the continuation of the work. If I am running behind the ice cream truck and suffer a fatal injury doing so, which is very likely to happen because of who I am as a person. But um, if that happens and I'm not here with you anymore, the work's gotta continue. And at that point, you'll have a new racial equity director. So I, I just wanna make sure that I recognize that as grateful as I am to have made these relations, uh, relationships with everyone in government, that um, I wanna make sure that folks see this as serving a bigger goal and not just interacting with a person who you know. Thank you. I, I appreciate you reminding us of that. And we, uh, we have a tremendous amount of respect for, uh, for the hard work you've done in standing up the, the office, as we say, <laughs> even though the office is one. Um, and we will continue this conversation um, around H196 and uh, the support positions that uh, are needed in order to continue this work and, uh, and cover more of the uh, projects that we know Vermonters are eagerly awaiting. So thank you for being with us. And thank, thank you, you uh, Kevin Christie, you're welcome to come back at, uh, after the joint assembly if you'd like to hear the next round of testimony on this. It'll be the same link.